Okay. Welcome everyone, ladies and gentlemen, to our last webinar, our US webinar for the UK IMG webinar series. Um, we are very glad to have you here. Uh, my name is Amanda and I'm going to be chairing this webinar. And I just wanted to introduce you um, to CHIPS first. We are the Cardiff Healthcare International Perspectives. And we are a Cardiff University Student Society, founded and primarily run by international medical students. And our committee went, aims to provide international perspectives, facilitate international experiences, run uh, academic revision sessions, uh, and organize social events. We fully try to engage with our members in every way possible. And the UK IMG webinar series was an initiative that aimed to provide a platform for UK medical students to learn about the application process of pursuing different training programs um, post-graduation. And in this webinar series, we invited speakers from various countries, such as, the, the Can such as Canada, Australia, the United States for today, Singapore, and much more. Each country had its own dedicated webinar on every Sunday across the months of August and September. And unfortunately, this is our last webinar and uh, we've been <laughs> very, very happy with the overwhelming signups and interest from, from you, the participants. And we would like to thank everyone for their participation. If you are here since the beginning of this webinar series, please drop down on the chat, chat function here. And uh, we really like, you know, clap to you because um, this this has been long, a long webinar series, but thank you so much for your interest. And we really hope that this webinar series helped you in finding your way um, after medical school uh, for medical training, deciding what you want to do. We also want to thank all of the speakers, uh, the amazing doctors that agreed to speak at our webinar series. It's been so, so helpful for everyone. And they've been kind enough all of the speakers to be here on Sundays, you know, Sundays, either morning, afternoon or night, depending on where they were in the world. So it's a tough, it's a tough day, it's a tough time. So, you know, really thank you for that to them. And I also wanted to highlight the incredible team that worked to put this webinar series together. So if I could ask just Seth and Oni to turn their cameras on and because Seth, Onis, and I have been working very hard to deliver this webinar series uh, for you guys over the, the past almost two months. And we've been very happy, really, really happy and grateful for all of the participation. So also I wanted to thank Seth and Onis for all the work, the hard work they put in. And very, very happy, and <laughs> very happy to work with you guys to deliver this webinar series. And I would also like to thank Chris, who is our graphic designer, and he created all of those amazing posters that you, that you saw on social media. So thank Chris for that. And also wanted to thank MMI UK and the Singapore Medical Society of the UK also for bridging the gap between us and the speakers and putting us in contact with the amazing, these amazing doctors and providing us and the participants with so much support throughout the whole series. And this has been a truly incredible experience and re for us, and we really hope that for you, it also has been incredible. So, you know, without further ado, I'm just gonna explain the structure of this session. We are going to start with Dr. Ban, explaining about the application process. And we also have Dr. Osama here, who's going to be explaining about how to be a competitive IMG in the United States. We will have a Q&A at the end, but you, are, you all entered this webinar with your cameras off and your microphones muted. Um, so please drop down in the, the chat on the, on the function on the, this webinar, just drop your questions down and we will try our best to just answer them throughout the whole webinar. The doctors will also be trying to answer them uh, on the chat box, and we'll also have a Q&A at the end where they can answer the questions live. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we'll also be posting a feedback form at the end of the session, and we'll be very, very grateful if you can um, answer the, the feedback form, because of course this webinar series is free, but 
you know, the price is true and to fill out the feedback form so that we know how we can improve later. Um, okay, without further ado, I'm just gonna introduce Dr. Ban. Uh, Dr. Ban is an alumnus of Chris College at the University of Cambridge. He completed the foundation program and embarked on a research fellowship at UT Southwestern in Dallas. He's now a PGY-5 resident in neurological surgery. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Ban, and the stage is all yours. Thank you for having me. Let me share my slides. Can you see my slides and can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so um, I've been tasked with uh, talking to you about the application process uh, to come to the United States to be a resident. Um, I think uh, everyone's experience is going to be a little bit different. Um, what I'm going to tell you is mainly going to be my experience, which, you know, if you talk to a whole group of different people, you're going to get a, perhaps a complete 180 on, on what they have experienced and what they think is the way to go and, and, and their strategy and so forth. So uh, the most important thing to be aware is to make sure that you tailor your um, approach based on what your goals are and, and, uh, and your own personal uh, circumstances. Um, I'm also trying to provide a very balanced overview. Uh, I want to be encouraging, but also uh, highlight some of the pitfalls and some of the uh, potential um, uh, uh, problems you may run into. Uh, with that in mind, uh, this is the outline. I will start with talking about the timeline and we'll go through some statistics. We'll talk about quote unquote selection criteria and how to prepare. If there is still time remaining, uh, we can address some of the other uh, topics uh, lower down the list. With the timeline, uh, this is roughly what you will experience if you were to pursue um, specialty training in the UK. Uh, the, can everyone see my pointer okay? Yes, we can. Okay. So you go to medical school, um, when you graduate, uh, typically you go through a two-year foundation program, followed by specialty training, of which there are multiple routes, and you end up uh, as a consultant uh, probably after uh, 10 years. In the United States, uh, it is a little bit different. Um, the medical students here have to go through a four-year undergraduate degree uh, prior to medical school. Medical school is four years. And depending on what specialty you choose, your residency can be anywhere between three years and seven years. So this is the uh, broad overview of what applying to residency is like. If we use the next uh, cycle, which is uh, the 2021 cycle, and work backwards, uh, residency starts on July 1st and match week is March of that year. Applications open uh, or have already opened um, where the applicants submit all their uh, documents into an electronic system called ERAS. Uh, typically for a US uh, medical student, their medical school will upload their details onto ERAS for an IMG, you have to apply to ERAS through the ECFMG, who will then issue you with a token to be able to log on to ERAS to submit your application. Um, all the applications are held until uh, a certain date in October, where they are released to all the programs that you, you choose to apply to. And from the point that your application is received by a program, um, you will then start hearing back about uh, interviews. And so it's very important to get all your application in before this particular date because um, most programs operate on a first come first serve basis. And so uh, on this particular date, you'll get a whole bunch of uh, applications and they'll send out 
uh, interview invites on a first come first serve basis. Once the interviews are uh, done, um, the programs will then make a list of candidates that they're interested in uh, and rank them in order. And similarly, uh, candidates will make a list of programs that they are interested in and rank them in order. And um, this ranking starts somewhere at the end of January and goes on until the end of February when you have to finalize your list. Uh, a couple of weeks later, in March, uh, is when the computer algorithm uh, determines and, and announces the uh, match results. For uh, applicants who do not um, end up matching to a program, there is a supplemental offer, uh, an acceptance program called the SOAP, which aims to match uh, unmatched applicants to unmatched programs. Essentially just to make sure that every uh, unfilled program gets filled and every unmatched applicant gets matched. Uh, that being said, as we'll go through in a little bit, uh, programs are filled and applicants still go unmatched. So a uh, quick word about the USMLE, I'm not gonna go into too much detail because I think uh, Dr. Said will be covering a lot of this information. Um, for someone going through medical school here, it is kind of built into part of their curriculum uh, as to when they are advised to do their uh, steps. For a uh, IMG, like I think most of you here would be, um, you have to consider the timeline as to when you want to do your exams. Um, and again, this is very personal. It's going to have to depend on your personal uh, circumstances, how ready you feel you're going to be, um, and what kind of specialty you're going to apply to. That being said, uh, there's been a recent uh, change in the uh, prerequisites in that in order to do step 2CS, you have to pass your step one. Prior to this, you can do the exams in any order you wish. So, um, and then there's the other side of the match, which uh, most people refer to as outside the match. Um, so there is also a route, which is, I'd say pretty, pretty common uh, that people will get into residency. Uh, in general, these will include uh, performing either a, a research fellowship or a clinical fellowship or, or doing a preliminary or a transitional year. The, uh, the timeline for, for a match and also the match can be very different. Obviously, the match is very regimented. Uh, you have to have a uh, six to nine month sort of uh, 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 plan uh, in order to make sure that you meet the deadlines. Uh, but for outside the match, it's a little bit more uh, loose, but that also means that you have to be really on top of things because no one's going to tell you you're too late for, for, for this coming cycle. So that's as far as the timeline is concerned. We will move on to statistics. Um, a lot of the information that I'll be presenting to you here can be found on the internet. Uh, the vast uh, uh, amount of data that has been collected through the years are compiled into a, a, a document that's called Charting the Outcomes. And I'm gonna go through several key tables to sort of illustrate some points. Uh, we'll start with this one, um, and I highlight my specialty uh, to sort of use as a point for, for discussion. Um, these are a list of specialties that offer positions at PGY1 level, and you can see the number of programs offered in a spot. You can see the number of positions in total. So obviously some programs offer more than one spot, um, and you can also see a list of unfilled programs by the end of the match cycle. Um, you'll notice that competitive specialties will have uh, very few unfilled spots, uh, whereas specialties like uh, big specialties like internal medicine, family medicine will have quite a few uh, unfilled spots left. Um, you also notice that the majority of applicants will be MD seniors, which are uh, medical students in their final year uh, on the year of application. Um, and if you go to the next slide, these are um, PGY2 positions. Uh, so for example, Dr. Said, uh, who is a, 
a dermatology resident. Uh, most of the dermatology applicants enter at PGY2 level. Uh, but the same goes for neurology, uh, PMNR, and radiology can give you an example. This next table here is similar to table one, uh, except that it's broken down by applicant type. Uh, here you will see uh, that again, uh, MD seniors, uh, which are the final year medical students, make up the majority of the applicants. Uh, there are also the DO medical students, and finally the IMGs. Uh, most of you are probably going to fall under this last category over here, non-US IMGs. And the key take home message for this uh, table is that there is a, a pretty uh, large cohort of IMGs uh, who apply for residency. Similarly for uh, the PGY2 positions. Uh, table 12 focuses specifically on IMGs matching into uh, PGY1 spots. Uh, as you can see, uh, over the years, the numbers can vary. Looking at my specialty specifically, it can go from eight on one year to 18 on another year. And again, uh, general trend remains the same. Uh, family medicine and internal medicine have a lot of uh, IMGs uh, successfully matching into those programs. Table 13 uh, looks at the number of uh, US uh, applicants who rank uh, each specialty as either their only choice, their first choice, or not their first choice. Um, the key point I'm trying to draw here is that most uh, applicants uh, will apply for only one specialty. Uh, you can see people who place, let's say, internal medicine as their only choice or as their first choice uh, far outnumber those who place internal medicine as uh, either the second, third, or fourth choices. Uh, this kind of tells you that people are very set in what they want to do, and there's not a whole lot of uh, um, cross-specialty applications going on. Uh, similarly, uh, this table here is uh, the same statistics for, for IMGs. Um, the general trend I think remains the same in that uh, people tend to apply just for the specialty that they want to, but obviously for IMGs, I think it is uh, perhaps uh, a little more common to apply for a backup specialty, for example. This next um, chart here uh, looks at uh, um, distinct specialties rank. So I'm looking at neurosurgery, people who apply for neurosurgery rank for the most part one specialty. Uh, there are a few people who rank two specialties. And as you can see here, although obviously neurosurgery is a very small field, people who rank three or more specialties don't tend to match into neurosurgery. And if you look at the number of contiguous ranks in that, let's say if you interview at 10 programs and you rank all 10 programs, um, then you would fall into 10 here. But if you only rank one program, then you would fall into this category. Again, your surgery is not a good example of that. Uh, but if you look at uh, internal medicine, for example, the more programs that you rank, the higher your probably a match in this. So you want to be aiming to rank as many programs as you can. Um, but the issue there is going to be uh, how many programs you apply to and how many programs you end up interviewing at. Uh, I mentioned briefly the SOAP uh, program earlier. Uh, this is for uh, applicants who end up unmatched uh, first time around. Uh, the process here uh, involves uh, this year at least four rounds where um, you have 24 hours in the programs who are until have 24 hours to reach out to you. Uh, I think they probably do a phone interview of some sort and then make a decision as to whether or not uh, they want you and whether you want them. And after 24 hours, a whole new list is, re uh, is uh, released on the unfilled programs and uh, the programs will get a list of unfilled applicants. And then that cycle com uh, continues four times. And by the end of that, this is the chart that we get. And you can see that uh, for internal medicine, um, 64 programs with 352 
spots, uh, you know, were unfilled uh, at the end of the first round. And then of that, uh, most of them managed to be filled through the soap process. Uh, that being said, there's still a that go unfilled by the end of that. So that's something to consider uh, as like a, um, a backup option. Um, this next table here uh, looks at the number of applicants per position available, some sort of a competition ratio uh, table. You will notice that most of the competition ratios are between uh, less than just under one and just a little bit over one. Uh, in contrast to the UK system where, uh, at least in my experience, um, applicants tend to apply to more than one specialty at once, that kind of seems to overinflate the competition ratio a little bit uh, with some specialties seeing a 61 applicant to position ratio. In the US, like we've discussed uh, uh, in, in the last few slides, people tend to apply only to the specialty of interest. And so the competition ratio uh, is uh, a little lower. So we then move on to selection criteria and I, I put these in, in uh, 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 parentheses uh, um, because there is, there is no clear criteria. Every program sets their own criteria. There is no national selection system, so to speak. Um, there are obviously a list of things that people always talk about and they are listed here on this table. Um, I drew a line here to separate, at least based on this year's statistics, what the uh, seemingly important factors are you can see for the non-US IMGs, uh, the more you rank, uh, the higher chances of matching. Um, the less you, the, the fewer specialties you apply for, the higher chances you, you are to match. Uh, obviously the higher scores are, the higher, the higher your chances of matching. It would seem like research, presentations, work experiences and higher degrees really don't make a whole lot of a difference. Um, but obviously, uh, these are um, criteria that are important enough to appear on these tables and, and things that they look for in, in your application form that I would certainly not suggest that you ignore completely. Another important uh, uh, topic which, which can uh, last a few hours of discussion in itself is, is the visa status. Um, the main issue is that um, sponsoring a visa uh, for a program is a lot of work. Uh, it is very expensive, and so for the most part, uh, programs are not uh, exactly excited to sponsor IMGs, um, especially with the whole uh, immigration situation being very fluid in the last few years, and with COVID and travel restrictions, I think uh, my guess is going to be that uh, this coming cycle, uh, we'll see IMGs being affected quite a bit compared to the, the last few years. Uh, from the program's perspective, they really don't want to have a situation where they've chosen a, a resident, but the resident is not able to start the program because of visa issues. And therefore, I think um, the visa issue is a very uh, important selection criteria. Quote, quote. Uh, I would suggest speaking to an attorney and, and looking at all the visa options and trying to see if you can uh, pick the best, uh, uh, safest one for you. There are also alternative pathways um, to coming to the US, uh, at least to train or, or to practice. And these include uh, uh, pursuing a fellowship, uh, repeating medical school to, to make yourself uh, essentially a uh, USMD uh, category, uh, and also repeating your residency after having uh, finished your residency elsewhere. Uh, I'm gonna skip through the USMD uh, statistics and selection criteria as uh, kind of touched through that briefly and I'm uh, hoping that uh, Dr. Syed will, will cover some of these. Uh, research and higher degrees I think are um, uh, also only really pertinent to certain specialties and, and certain institutions. Uh, just briefly I think if you are applying to a big institution in a very competitive specialty it will not hurt to have a higher research output and, um, and a higher degree. That being said, if you don't have any of these, it's certainly not a uh, roadblock. 
So we move on from talking about selection criteria to how to prepare. And I think uh, one of the major things to do uh, if you are to go down this pathway is to decide on your timeline and your goals. Uh, do you want to start your residency uh, next July, in which case it's probably too late uh, if you haven't done anything yet. If you want to start your residency in July 2022, then you need to be aware of what the timeline is like this year to be able to anticipate that for the following cycle. You need to decide on your goal. Um, are you hoping to match at all costs? Are you hoping to match in a very competitive specialty? Do you not mind any specialty as long as you're in the US? Uh, do you want to be in a big institution? Uh, or do you not mind if you go to a rural area? These will affect your strategy as how you prepare. Uh, and then the next question is, uh, do you want to go through the match or do you want to go outside the match? Um, certainly going through the match has, uh, you know, it's pros and cons. It's very um, organized. Uh, you'll get somewhat of a um, uh, similar experience to the medical students here, uh, but obviously uh, you will have the same um, uh, disadvantages as any IMGs in that the institution for the most part will not know what your background is and, and they will be taking a risk on you. Going outside the match uh, has the benefit of actually getting to know, um, depending on how you go outside the match, uh, will have the benefit of having the program know you a little bit better before they, they commit to you. Um, and also allows you to use the match as a backup if, if your uh, strategy of going on to the match uh, does not work out. Um, options for uh, going on to the match includes uh, clinical uh, fellowship and research fellowships. Uh, these are for the most part not centralized. You just have to email programs and, and a lot of it also is by word of mouth uh, on how you can find a position like that. If you have not already uh, uh, finished medical school uh, or done your, your electives, uh, a very important contributor to matching uh, ultimately is uh, actually spending some time uh, as a medical student uh, on your elective, for example. So I would certainly suggest that you, uh, you pursue that. I think Dr. Syed has, has may have this in, in, his, uh, in his talk as well. Um, in terms of how to stand out, I think Dr. Syed is going to cover that, so we'll skip through that. Choosing a program, uh, we kind of touched on that a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, I'm using, again, neurosurgery as, as, a, an, as an example. As you can see here, uh, most of the programs cluster around the major cities and, and the coastlines. And uh, there is a whole lot of rural America uh, where very few programs exist. So you have to decide where you want to go and if you have any specific geographical constraints. Uh, in terms of size, uh, we talked about uh, a little bit about uh, whether a program is an academic institution or whether it's a rural program. Obviously, the academic one will be bigger uh, with more resources, uh, more residents that they take. Uh, so the opportunity to sort of squeeze another one in is perhaps higher. On the other hand, if you go to a rural program uh, where perhaps not many people want to go to, the competition might be less and you may stand a higher chance of matching. Again, there are no hard and fast, fast rules. It's just all dependent on a particular year, a particular program, and your particular circumstances. Um, as far as the faculty, uh, uh, Makeup is concerned. Obviously, in a major institution, uh, faculty have uh, subspecialty interests, and that may be something that you find very important in, in deciding where you want to go, uh, particularly if you want to be exposed to subspecialty training. Uh, and reputation uh, comes along with that. As far as local competition is concerned, um, if you go to a major city, you have three or four programs sometimes in the same city. So that somewhat dilutes out the number of uh, patients or cases that you come across. Uh, on the other hand, if you are in a rural area, uh, pretty much everyone within a few hundred mile radius uh, will come to you. So one thing to really bear in mind is how expensive it is for the whole system to train a resident. And uh, it's just important to keep that in mind when you're preparing because ultimately, like, like we've also discussed, uh, they are making a huge investment in you as much as you are making in, in 
investment in them and your own future. So how are we doing with time? Um, you, can, you can finish your presentation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in terms of motivation, this kind of, uh, this kind of segues uh, in from, from the uh, how to prepare section. I think uh, it's very important to think about why you want to come to the U.S. You know, why do you want to do medicine? Similar uh, sort of a, a thought process. Why do you want to do specialty X, for example? Um, some people do it for the money. And certainly that's not advisable. Some people do it for fame, same thing. It's not really uh, feasible uh, motivation to be using. And everyone's uh, circumstances is a little different, uh, but it's very important to find your own motivation as to why you want to do this. Because it's not, it's not an easy journey. Uh, you will have to sacrifice a lot just to get in. And even after you get in, you will have to sacrifice a lot just to stay. Uh, to give you an example, um, this is one very small aspect of what you have to sacrifice, for example, the application fee. Um, we talked about applying to as many programs as you can, but that comes to the cost. Um, for the first um, 10 programs, uh, you know, you can see from this table, uh, you pay a flat fee of $99, but with each additional program, uh, the application fee goes up. So I've uh, outlined an example here. If you were to apply to 100 programs, that would cost you $2,000 uh, just for the application fee. And uh, the website I took this from gave a few other examples here if you're applying for different specialties, for example. And then after you interview, you rank your programs. Ranking the programs itself also costs money. Let's say you want to rank, let's say you've interviewed at 50 places uh, and you want to rank all 50. Mm -hmm. uh, you can go down this list and see how much it will cost. Uh, and I think the maximum you can rank is 300. And you know, if you were to rank 300 programs, uh, it would cost you close to $9,000. Um, all across the board, uh, you know, the, the attrition rate is, is not uh, that high, but obviously it's still there. Uh, certain specialties, particularly the, the more uh, stressful uh, surgical specialties will have a higher attrition rate. And that is something to keep in mind. Uh, there's a reason why people drop out and a lot of the time it's burnout or uh, just not having the right expectation as to why they, they came in in the first place. Um, life in the US, I think um, it is very different from what being in the UK as a, um, a junior doctor there is. Uh, it, you know, I spent a couple of years there in, in the foundation program and uh, you work a lot more here than you do there. Um, and the level of support that I, I got here uh, seemed to be better than, than, than what I got when, uh, you know, many years ago back in the UK. Uh, just to give you uh, some very brief specific examples, uh, in the UK, uh, it would be the F1 or the F2's job uh, to, to draw the labs in the morning, sometimes to put the NG tube in, put the Foley in, and, and so forth. Here, the nurses pretty much take care of all of that. Uh, you know, we have our own um, uh, scuff work and, and annoyances too, but uh, I think um, most people always think about the grass being greener on the other side, and, and to some extent that's true. Um, when you graduate and, and uh, finally come up to practice on your own, there's a, a difference too in, in, in the way that works uh, in an academic setting as well as in the practice setting. Um, Obviously in the UK, everything is mostly NHS. Here, uh, there are options for academia, uh, which can be um, tied in with a, uh, a, a university setting or, or sometimes with, um, uh, with a semi-government type institution. Uh, there's a huge practice uh, uh, opportunity here for those of you who are interested um, and, and Essentially, this model is, you know, the more you work, uh, the more your reimbursement is. And a quick look at reimbursement, uh, although, like I've said earlier, this should not be uh, the main reason why you're doing this. Uh, this is the typical uh, pay scale for uh, a junior doctor in the UK. And this is a typical uh, resident uh, reimbursement here in the US, 
two different institutions across two different states. Uh, for the consultants, uh, there is a very specific pay scale in the UK, uh, but in the US, it can vary so widely. Uh, there are several websites that I'm sure you can uh, Google and look up uh, what the median salaries are. Uh, there are uh, companies out there collecting data on uh, a whole host of specialties and, and you know, grouping uh, these reimbursement uh, rates into quartiles and, and, and so forth. Uh, just a quick word in terms of uh, vacation and benefits. Uh, people work hard here. Uh, you get a lot less holiday. Um, there is not so much of a standardized uh, um, study leave, or sick leave, or health insurance uh, type uh, policy. Everything varies according to the institution that you're at. Um, I mentioned this uh, not too long ago, uh, work hours are longer here. Um, they hire the residents with um, education in mind, but at the same time, you're being paid a salary with the expectation that uh, there is some pro service provision involved, and that's where your salary is, is going towards. It's funding uh, the salary and the service provision that you're providing to the patients. Uh, they, they have a uh, supply and demand uh, uh, algorithm where they, they take in a certain amount of, of residents to, to meet a certain amount of demand in the society and usually there's not a whole lot of surplus so they're not going to have um, you know 10 surgery residents uh, when there are not enough cases to, to train all 10 of them uh, so therefore they take fewer re uh, residents uh, I'm talking about surgery uh, as an example but on the flip side um, because they are restricting uh, the number of residents they take to ensure that every single one of them uh, is well trained. Uh, the work has to be divided between less people, and so each person has, ends up doing a little bit more work. And that's the sort of trade-off that uh, that is uh, the norm here. Uh, we get a lot of APP coverage, which is uh, basically uh, MPs and PAs, and that sort of helps uh, uh, lessen the burden. But obviously, these uh, are very costly as well. So um, just to conclude, uh, several take home points. I think it's very important that you decide uh, if you want to commit to this process. And once you've decided, you have to be prepared to sacrifice. Uh, planning is always uh, key to success. You wanna plan early, uh, as early as you can. Uh, make plan B, plan C, and plan D. And a uh, uh, common sort of saying here is you should be available, which means you wanna be there at every single opportunity. You wanna, uh, quote unquote, uh, show that you're present. You wanna be affable, you wanna be likable. Uh, you wanna be someone that they wanna work with. And uh, perhaps lastly, certainly not least, uh, you wanna be able, you wanna be competent, you wanna be knowledgeable, and you wanna show that you deserve to be there. Um, I've learned a lot from, from people I've talked to over the years, and, and I'm hoping that, uh, um, that this session is, is a way of paying it forward to you guys and I hope that you guys will do the same if you decide to go down this pathway in the future. Uh, include some links here uh, on, on some of the uh, major websites you should be looking into and if you have any more further questions uh, I'm happy to answer them uh, as Dr. Sai is talking or uh, after this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ban, for sharing your wisdom and also your experience. Um, for the sake of time, we will move on to Dr. Osama's uh, talk, but we will have a Q&A at the end, and some participants have asked specific questions about your presentation on the, the chat box. So if you can answer them um, it, when Dr. Osama is presenting, that would be very helpful. And thank you, Dr. Osama, for answering so many questions on the chat box. I know it's like your fingers must be hurting so much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, so, I think I need five minutes just to recover, put these in some ice, and then we can restart. Exactly. <laughs> we can give you like a one minute break. <laughs> um, so, to introduce Dr. Osama, uh, he's a graduate from the Imperial College of London. He is currently a chief resident in dermatology at Mount Sinai Hospital, Manhattan, in New York. 
He has also recently started a company with a few colleagues of his called um, Liberty Medics. We're going to post the link to Liberty Med Medics here on the chat box because it's such a useful website. Um, and aside from the main paid course that they have, they also offer free access to all articles and videos to help international medical graduates with the application process of pursuing residency in the US. So that's very helpful. Um, so we're gonna be posting the link here on the chat box if you wanna have a look. Thank you, Dr. Osama, for being here with us. Uh, the stage is yours. Okay, let me just start by sharing my screen. Uh, can you guys all see that? Yes. If you can put that on full screen, that would be yes. very helpful. Okay, perfect. Slide, is that perfect. okay perfect. So guys, you may be familiar with me from the chat section now. I'm the one who's been furiously typing for the last uh, 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ban, for that wonderful presentation. It was uh, incredibly thorough and it's uh, a lot to live up to and I will not try. So don't assume <laughs> this one's gonna be as thorough as Dr. Ban. Uh, I'm just here to give you more of a flavor of how to be a competitive IMG, which is the brief I was given. So. Um, I really appreciate that introduction from Amanda. I will just briefly expand upon it before I carry on. Um, I was a graduate from Imperial College in London in 2016. Um, I had not been sure that I wanted to go to the US for most of my time in medical school. You guys are all planning ahead, which is fantastic. I was still kind of on the fence, but um, I wanted to keep all of my options open. So throughout my final year of medical school is when I did my step one exam. I applied for US electives, but at the same time, I wasn't sure that I was definitely gonna to go to the US. So I wanted to make sure I was doing everything properly in the UK system as well to apply. So I applied for my AFPs, I did all, all those interview process, et cetera. And I was actually due to start one at Guy's in St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, and just before I did that, I, I decided to resign and move to New York. So this was about a month before I ever started working in the NHS. So um, I know uh, some of you were asking in the chat section, like, when is the earliest you can go and things like that. And I spoke to a lot of you and I said, oh, you know, usually people finish their F1 first and then they apply for residency to, uh, so that they can get full GMT registration. Um, I decided that I was not interested in working as a doctor in the UK. So my options were, I'm either going to work as a doctor in the US or I'm going to leave medicine in the UK. <laughs> That's where I was sitting. So from that perspective, I knew that not doing F1 for me wasn't the biggest deal because either way, I wasn't going to regret it. So I resigned, uh, much to the horror of my Imperial College tutors. And after a lot of meetings with the heads of year and personal tutors and things like that, they let me go and uh, I then moved across to New York. I applied for residency in that same cycle right after medical school, so the 2016-2017 cycle. And I was lucky enough to match into my top choice program here in Manhattan at Mount Sinai uh, during that first application cycle. So I'm currently a chief resident, as Amanda mentioned, and what that means in the US system is that because residency is so short, I'm currently eight months from being a consultant. Now that's not what you typically imagine. When you're in the UK, consultants have a lot more gray hair than this, and this is all natural. This isn't dermatologically enhanced hair right now. So here in the US, because the training program is much shorter, that means I'm very close to actually being done with it all, and safe to say I'm counting down the months. So, um, also, as uh, Amanda mentioned, I uh, founded this company called Liberty Medics, which I'll touch upon a bit later on in the process. So to begin with, the brief I was giving is what makes a competitive IMG? So that begs the question, what, what does it mean to be competitive, basically? And the reason why it's hard to give a blanket answer for this is because me giving this answer to different people will have different answers. So first and foremost, it depends on what you're aiming for. As Dr. Ban mentioned, there are those different metrics for things like USMLE step scores and how many interviews before you can be sure you'll match and publications and all those kind of things. And uh, a lot of how strong an applicant you are depends on the following things. What specialty are you aiming for? What type of institution are, do you have in your crosshairs? How flexible are you about those things? And when it comes to all of those things put together, it then helps you to get a better sense of where you stand as an applicant and therefore how hard you need to work in order to be considered a strong applicant for those things. So to speak in these specifics about these thousands of different programs, as Dr. Ban mentioned, there's no centralized system. In the UK, you put yourself through that FPAS scoring system, you work hard for five years in medical school and you get your decile ranks and everything. And then in the end, the SJT messes up your scores anyway, and it doesn't matter and you end up all the way in like Scotland somewhere that you didn't want to be. Uh, but it's all one centralized system in the UK. In the US, it's not like that. Every single program is completely independent. 
Every single program just has a chairman, program directors and associate program directors, senior faculty and chief residents typically who sit down together, manually screen the applicants. They're the ones who send down the interview panels and each one of them have their own little quirks about what they're looking for. So there'll be some people, I know, for example, some uh, psychiatry program directors or even some internal medicine program directors who will say, oh, um, what I really uh, look at a lot in people's applications is their volunteer experiences. And that just blows my mind. I'm like, of all of the things, like, you know, the step one schools, everything, you're looking at volunteer experiences that people make up all sorts of stuff about. But for some people, that's what they look at. So that's why I say it's difficult to speak in specifics about all these thousands of different programs. So no matter what, whether you fit in this traditional model of what is considered to be competitive or not, uh, don't assume that is like a broad, you know, uh, brush with which you'll be painted. There are some programs that may value people who aren't even conventionally strong applicants. So that's good. It means you can have a bit of hope if you don't fit into that category. And if you do think you're a strong applicant, just know that not everyone might will think you're a strong applicant and don't take it personally. But I am going to speak to you guys in overall principles. Otherwise I would end the presentation now and say, okay, that's everything, good luck. But I'm gonna to talk to you about the kind of things that people typically uh, look through and consider to be you know, what makes a strong applicant. And this isn't gonna surprise many of you, I'm sure the, the overall categories of things to look at are exams, research and publications, awards. I know everyone loves awards, right? So I'm not really gonna expand upon that one much. If you happen to be someone that's won a lot of awards in medical school for academic purposes, or if you've won awards otherwise, there are sections in the, your application uh, through the match where you can list those, which is always looked upon favorably. Then electives and letters of recommendation, which are kind of tied together and which are a little bit difficult right now, but I'll expand upon those sections when I get there. So first and foremost, exams. So uh, I had get this question quite a lot through the Liberty Medics things and the various courses I've done in the past. Uh, do your medical school exams count? And uh, the truth of it is they actually do. So it, they don't count to the same degree as the US Assembly exams. I think, again, speaking in broad terms, there'll be somewhere there's exceptions, but in broad terms, most programs will look at your step scores as superseding whatever you've done in your medical school, which again is good news. If some of you were, you know, kind of late bloomers when it came to medical school, you were enjoying your freshers year a little bit too much, had a couple of bad instances through, throughout your medical school exams, a few recents, et cetera, it's not the end of the world. It's not like that's gonna be what screens you out of most programs. Um, so the step scores do supersede uh, your medical school exams on the whole. However, they do have access to your transcripts. Part of when you apply is uh, you have your medical school transcript that's directly sent uh, to programs. And I thought, again, maybe that's a formality, a tick box, they don't really look at it. But throughout my interview cycle, most of the places I went to, they alluded to my performance in medical school exams, which for me was good. So I was happy that they did mention them. But it kind of made me think, oh, wow, like they really do look at these. So um, it helps them build a picture of how overall kind of book smart this person is are we going to have any issues when it comes to this person passing their board exam at the end of their residency which is something which uh adds prestige or takes away prestige from a program if their own residents pass or fail the board exams so that's something which they do look at then it comes to your usmle exams now traditionally this was a little bit easier because what i would say to you is the step one exam really is by far and away the most important of all of the step exams and uh it's probably on balance, if you had to pick one thing that was going to be the most important part of your application, it would have been the step one exam. Now, the reason I say that with a bit of a past tense is because, as you guys see there, there's going to be a score system change in January 2022. So um, I'm going to talk still about the USMLE step one exams and the importance of them and what's a good score, etc., because it is still pertinent. But just know that there is going to be a score system change in January 2022. Right now, the step one exam, after you take it, uh, you're given a three-digit numeric score. So a pass score for the USME step one is about 190, and the average score these days for a step one exam is around 235. So that's to kind of give you a reference point for, for what normal scores are, and then like really good scores are sometimes seen as like above 250 or something, is the kind of scores people tell you if you're applying for things like plastic surgery, etc. So um, that's how it was traditionally, but as of January 22, all you're going to get is pass or fail. That's what all will come up in your transcript is pass or fail. Now, some people are really, were really happy to hear that news. They're like, amazing, like it was the bane of my life, the fact that I had to force myself to get every additional point. Uh, and now all I have to do is pass. And passing the step one is really not that difficult at all. Or, most people will be able to pass the step one with very minimal effort. Uh, what made it difficult and like what kept you up at night was the fact that every additional digit mattered. So you really never knew that you were prepared enough. So some people were kind of relieved to hear that, oh, there's going to be a, a score change in January 2022 and we can relax. However, as IMGs, when what you really need is to help yourself stand out, especially if you're aiming for competitive specialties and competitive programs, 
Um, you want as many options as possible to make these people pause and think, hmm, should we just screen this guy because he's an IMG or are they going to give me a reason to, to stand back for a second and think, all right, let's, let's give him some consideration. So I personally advise all of you, all of you who should be, you know, even if you're not aiming for like a dermatology or whatever, even if you're aiming for, we're all aiming for prestigious programs as best as possible, right? Like we would rather go to Harvard and Mayo Clinic than, than uh, go to a community program. So for all of you, I would encourage you, try your absolute best to take the USMLE step one before this score change comes into effect. Even if that means that you're actually only going to apply for the match six years down the line, five years down the line, as long as you get your score before January 2022, that score will give you uh, for 10 years. And if you pass the other step exams and you become ECFMG certified, you actually keep that score for life. So that means that even if you're applying four or five years down the line, you're a sec first year, second year medical student right now, just make, put it in your head that it will be a huge benefit for you to make sure you take that step exam before January 2022. After that point, it's just going to be past fail and you've lost an opportunity to impress people. So that's a little bit about the step one. The step two CK, briefly speaking, the step one is like basic sciences. Imagine what you did in your first couple of years in medical school, the stuff that we all hated uh, doing, you know, biochemistry and microbiology and the Krebs cycle and all those urea cycle and all those cycles that no one understands with all the cofactors, all those kind of things. So that's all step one stuff. Step two, a CK stands for step two clinical knowledge. And that's much more similar to your final year medical school exams. The clinical years where you're actually answering uh, clinical based questions. And then the step two CS is the step two clinical skills exam. And that's like an OSCE that we have over there in England, where there's actually a live patient. You have to traditionally take it in the US. I say traditionally because right now they've been paused for a year due to COVID. Not a great idea for people to fly from all around the world and touch each other and, and spread COVID everywhere in test centers. So they've been suspended for a year, but they will be restarting again once COVID is taken care of. Um, so yeah, I'm still gonna mention it. So step two CS is the OSCE exams. It's actually a bit easier than the OSCE uh, exams that we have in the UK because it's just you and a simulated patient in the room and there's not actually a doctor watching you. So I know in the UK, the thing that used to give me the most anxiety is like there'd be a consultant peering over me while I was percussing, pretending I knew what I was listening for. Um, whereas in the US in these exams, it's just you and a simulated patient. So it's actually quite a relaxed exam. The, the reason most people fail this, if they do fail it, is because of a spoken English proficiency. So typically that's for people who are coming from countries where English isn't their native language. So if you're a UK medical student and you fail your spoken English proficiency, we need to have a talk. So chances are the step two CS is going to be uh, fine for the rest of you. And I've grayed out the step three exam. I wouldn't worry too much about the step three exam at this point. Um, it's not one that you need for applying for residency. It's not one that will give you this thing called the ECFMG certification, which means that you can start residency. Uh, the step three is something which most people in the US do during their residency. So it's not a part of the screening uh, uh, process and it's not something that will necessarily make you a more competitive applicant. So we're going to ignore that one. So let me go to the step one. So what is a good step one score? As I mentioned, uh, a good step one score, it's, it depends. So a pass is 192, but as I say there, this means nothing. If you were to get a 192 and you were like, yes, maybe you could get into a rural program, middle of nowhere, family medicine, and that, and that would be a, a good program for them. But the truth is that like, you need to be scoring much higher than that if you want to be considered a good step one score. Now I say it's very opaque because it's hard to know when you say, when you look at your score and it says 230, it doesn't tell you, oh, that means you're on the percentile of, the, of everyone. It's not a percentage score. It's kind of just a weird numeric three-digit score. But um, to get a good sense of it, just know that roughly 235 aligns with the 50th percentile and then use your standard deviations to understand kind of what the range of scores are. So um, what's a good step one? So yeah, the answer to this is based on the context. If you wanted to apply for internal medicine and you were quite flexible, like I don't care where I go in the US, as long as I, I'm uh, going to match into internal medicine somewhere, I'm happy. Then if you came and told me, oh, I got a 230, I'd be like, solid, like, you know, that, that's fine. You're going to still get plenty of interviews depending on the rest of your app uh, application. And that's fine. That's a good step one score for you. But if you told me like it's been my life ambition to do derm or ortho, ortho, plastics, et cetera, in the US, um, and then I, you say, I got a 230 and I'm an IMG. I would say you may need to end up reconsidering whether this is actually going to be feasible for you because some, most programs, they want you to have like a standout score if you're applying for a program that competitive, even if you're a US applicant, let alone if you're an IMG. So yeah, that's why it's a little bit complicated to know what a good step one score is. Dr. Ban uh, mentioned this thing called uh, charting outcomes in the match. And this is a document which comes out at the end of each match cycle and it summarizes data from the previous cycle, gives you more insights into, you know, the, the, 
characteristics of people who did and didn't match, etc. Um, the screenshot is from the 2018 version, but there's a, there's a 2020 version even that you can look at now. And um, they come with these little score charts, basically. And it shows you, um, this isn't from the 2018 version. I think this is from the 2019 version. It shows you the average step one score for um, US and medical students who matched and didn't match in all of these various specialties. So as you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but you can tell there's a, there's a different range depending on what the, what the specialty is that you're applying for. So for example, things like pathology and pediatrics, uh, people who matched there were scoring below 230, even on average, they were scoring below 230. Uh, PMNR, which is physical medicine rehab, average scores of 220, or even here, family medicine, average scores of 220 were enough to match. Now, if you're looking at the programs like say dermatology, the average score of a US medical student who matched in dermatology is a 250, and that's average. So they also have tables showing what the average scores of IMGs are who have matched in these specialties, but I think they can actually be a tiny bit misleading because sometimes there'll be a case where, for example, a department knows an IMG and they've worked with them for years and years and years and they've published with them extensively and then they'll match. And because the N number, if you guys remember from your biostats, the sample size is small when it comes to the number of IMGs who even match in something like dermatology. Because that sample size is small, you can get kind of a confusing picture where sometimes the average score for an IMG to match is lower than the average score for an American grad to match. And we all know that they don't prefer us over the American grads, if only. So th there's clearly something weird going on there. So what I tell people is, look at the US uh, chart of what the average scores are, and then as a rule of thumb, add about 10 to, to, to assure yourself that you're a strong applicant for that specialty. So with that being said, that would mean if you're applying for something like dermatology at 10, you're talking like a 260 step score, which is something that would, you know, make people pause and, and be willing to overcome the fact that you're an IMG to consider you for that specialty. So obviously that's extremely difficult, but you all know apply, applying for things like orthopedics and dermatology is going to be extremely difficult one way or another. But let's look at the, the uh, example of internal medicine as an alternative. What that means is if the average score of a US person matching an IM is 235, in order for you to be a really strong applicant, you should be aiming for above 245. So using that as a general rule of thumb, I think is the best we can do for trying to um, get a sense of how strong our step one scores are. Okay, now moving on to the next part of this. I'm sorry I have to rush through this. Each of these sections deserves like four or five hours of explanation for each of them, um, but we're gonna try and make it work. So the next section, research. When it comes to your application uh, for, for ERAS, which is what you apply through uh, for the match, they ask you to list something called research experiences. Now, research experiences aren't publications themselves. So you can't write down a case report as an experience for yourself. That's just, that was a publication that happened. An experience is when you've actually been an ongoing part of a research group or a research project for a period of time. And they ask you to list how many hours per week, when you started, how long that went for, when it ended and who your supervisor was. So um, if, for example, you're working, you know, one hour a week with a research group at your institution, that counts as an experience. So you can write, I was doing an orthopedic project, you know, into something about breaking bones in mice or something in a lab. And uh, I worked with this supervisor and I did this for two years, one hour a week. Cool, that counts as research experience. So that's something which you list in your application. And then in a separate section, you actually list the publications themselves. So that's when you're talking about your peer review publications, your poster presentations, everything like that. Um, now, when it comes to what's more important, the number or the quality, et cetera, the number I think is the, when they're screening applicants, they don't really do a deep dive as such into all of their research backgrounds, unless they're a very academic center or unless the, um, they're a type of specialty that cares a lot about, about uh, publications. On the whole, having an, a big number to begin with is good because it kind of frames the way they see you. Like they think, okay, this guy's academic and they don't really do it. They don't really realize they're all like letters to editors and pointless case reports. At the time they take a snapshot and they're like, okay, this guy's quite academic, we get it. Then when it comes to interview, they definitely do look at your um, publications in more detail because they want to be able to ask you questions about them. Okay, so. Now, this is, an, again, from the charting outcomes in the match. Um, this is just to give you a sense that it really is specialty dependent how much um, research is seen as good and how many publications are seen as good. So I get a lot of UK medical students kind of panicking, being like, I only have one publication, I only have two publications. Does that mean I have no chance of matching in the US? And I say not at all, because if you look at um, the number, the average numbers for people who have matched into different programs, if you're going for something like internal medicine, it's okay if you've got like, two posters and one publication, like that's, that's fine. That, that's like the average of the people who've gone and successfully match. 
Now, there are some specialties which are like standout in this respect, and orthopedic surgery is, is renowned for being one of those where they demand a lot of publications. So if you're uh, an IMG who's expecting to match into orthopedic surgery, you have to be willing to put in the time. And similarly, actually, for dermatology, I don't know if it's reflected here, but yeah, you can see the average number of like matched people for non-US IMGs. They've got like, you know, 12, 13 publications, etc. So um, it's not something which is a must, but if you want to be a really strong competitive applicant, I do think publications do help. And I think especially it depends on, on what the quality of those are, if it's a, a, a type of specialty which is particularly academic. So now moving on to electives. Again, there's so much more to be said about research and publications. I'm sorry we can't go into all the details about those, but I want to give you guys a good global review. The US clinical experience. Now, pre-COVID times, it was all very simple. I would tell you guys, this is absolutely essential. US clinical experience. So many US medical graduates to me, like my, my, like my friends are going to Singapore, they're gonna get signed off after like half a day and then they're gonna go island hopping. That sounds really fun. I really wanna go do that. Like, do I actually have to do an elective in the US? And the truth is, if you're serious, if you're serious about a future in the US, even if you wanna keep your options open. So for me, I wasn't sure, but I wanted to keep my options open. I knew that even to realistically keep your options open, you need to pursue US clinical experience. It's almost essential. And um, medical school is actually the only time you are legally allowed to have hands-on clinical experience in the US without being a licensed physician who's, um, who's ECFMG certified and has gone through the match and, and uh, the US Assembly exams, et cetera. So make the most of this opportunity in medical school. Do not let medical school pass you by your elective block and you've decided to use that for something else. If you're serious about the US, you must, must, must try and arrange US clinical experience. And the reason for that is, one, a lot of programs require US clinical experience, otherwise they screen you out. And apart from that, the place that you go and spend your time at during elective is almost always a guaranteed interview, unless you've had a disaster of a month, in which case, leave it behind. But most likely that is your best chance of getting an interview because you're known to a department. And I say this over and over again in the Liberty Medics courses, the most important thing is you want to become a real person to the department and not just a name on a piece of paper. It's really easy to see Osama Sayyid and be like, no, probably more so with Osama Sayyid than anyone else. So you guys aren't called Osama. It's probably easier for you. But for me, especially, it's really easy to just um, dismiss an IMG. But if they know you, if they're like, oh, this isn't just Osama Sayyid on paper, but we know Osama. He spent a month with us. He's a nice guy, et cetera, et cetera. If I can toot my own horn. Um, then th that makes it so much more difficult for these people to screen you out. And it makes them so much more likely to treat you as a human and want to invite you back for interview. So it's absolutely crucial in that respect. And the other way it's really important, which I think is what I talk about next, is because of letters of recommendation. So letters of recommendation, um, this also needs a lot of uh, discussion, but briefly speaking, letters of recommendation are something which uh, a physician uploads on your behalf into your application in the cycle in which you're applying for residency. Um, so you're supposed to have them upload it and you're supposed to waive the right to even see the letter because that makes it clear that, you know, this isn't something which you've pressured someone into saying and they know you're going to read. So they have to write nice things. So they upload it for you. What you'll learn about the U.S. over time is that they value themselves over anyone else in the world. And that's a recurring theme in almost everything. So even when it comes to letters of recommendation, the opinion of a U.S. doctor to them means infinitely more than a doctor from your home country. Overall, you're allowed to send a maximum of four letters of recommendation to any program that you're applying to in the match. As a rule of thumb, one of those should be from your home institution or someone in the UK, whether that's your NHS trust, your medical school, et cetera. So one should be from someone there who has known you long-term and who can speak about you in a bit more detail long-term. But then you should aim for the other three letters of recommendation to come from US-based physicians. Now, how are you gonna get that if you haven't had an elective? Even when you've had one elective in the US, it's sometimes very difficult to get three letters of recommendation. So let alone if you've had no US clinical experience, the, the options of getting these a US letters of recommendation are very, very difficult and restricted. So um, that is why basically electives are essential in a very uh, summarized format. But what about with coronavirus? So th this is again, obviously, it's a spanner in the works. This is completely non-ideal for everyone. Um, all US programs have suspended international travel for the purpose of, of electives, whether that's observerships, whether that's hands-on clinical electives, all those kind of things, they've been suspended. And not only for, the, for international graduates, but you also have to realize that's the same for US graduates. So normally US medical students in their uh, fourth year or third year, they start to do away rotations where they kind of audition at different programs that they might be interested in. The same way we go over an audition on our electives. Um, even within the US, all of these internal electives have been completely called off. 
So if it makes you feel any better, you're not the only ones whether it being in the UK or other countries uh, that have missed out on this. Even the US people have missed out on this. So um, as part of uh, Liberty Medics, one um, new feature that we're, we've been adding to our course catalog is something called the Program Director Interview Series, where I go and I sit down either remotely or in person with program directors at, at different institutions, and I get to put questions to them and, and record their answers and then share it with people. So I recently spoke to program directors from uh, Mount Sinai in internal medicine and also uh, um, Dr. Jatin Diaz from uh, Mass General, which is the Harvard internal medicine program. So arguably two of like the top five IM programs in the whole country. And I spoke to them about this basically, like, are programs going to have to relax their requirements or is it just tough luck for anyone who's like missed their window in this next year? And they both said uh, unanimously, like, listen, we're going to have to be flexible. We know that this isn't the fault of the people who are uh, stuck during this one year cycle, or who, who have missed their elective periods. And uh, we're not going to hold it against them because we know that it's got nothing to do with them. So I encourage you guys to look at these two interviews on uh, our Instagram page where the previews are up there. And, um, just listen to what they have to say, because if you're really nervous and you think, oh my God, this is doomed me, maybe this will make you feel a bit better. Broadly speaking, however, when it comes to like next summer, I'm fairly confident, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I'm fairly confident by next summer, life is gonna be much closer to normal. And I think um, electives and things will resume. So if you're a medical student right now and your um, medical school's elective period was either last spring, like the one that just passed, or next year and you think you're gonna miss the opportunity, it's unfortunate, but you can list that when you do apply that, by the way, my window of opportunity for hands-on experience passed me, but there are things you can do. So there are things called observerships, which again, I'm sure will restart by next summer. And what observerships are is you also go as usually a uh, foreign doctor. So you've already graduated, meaning you're not allowed to have hands-on experience, but you can still come to a department and observe them. And you're basically part of the team. You still go on ward round, you still see patients, but you're not allowed to go independently do things. Um, but it still gives you an opportunity. So technically these observations aren't as good as hands-on clinical electives, but you are still allowed to um, impress people, right? Like you can be proactive, you can get involved in research projects, you can be part of case discussions. So uh, we, again, we have a whole section on how to make the most of your uh, US clinical experience where we talk about those kind of things in our course. But on the whole, I would strongly recommend that even if you don't have hands-on clinical experience, Go out there, do these observerships, and that is still your chance to get known and become a real person to these programs. So do not despair. There's always options. So um, going on to the next part of what makes you a competitive IMG, research fellowship. So as Dr. Ban mentioned, these are things which aren't like well standardized. There's not like a portal through which you can apply for research fellowships. It really is based on if you know people, and that's why typically when you go there and you just spend an elective with the department, you can go speak to them and say, oh, by the way, do you guys ever do research fellowships? And if they do, then spending time in the department in a research fellowship is a very common path to helping IMGs especially match into competitive programs. When it comes to programs like Derm and Ortho, even US grads now typically have spent one year volunteering usually without being paid at a department doing full-time research just to ingratiate themselves to the department and, and increase their chances of matching in residency. So if that's the case for US medical students, it applies even more so for IMGs. So keep that in mind, try and factor in whether you'd be willing to do that and uh, try and figure out how you can network as best as possible to arrange that if you're going for an ultra competitive uh, specialty. So to summarize in my own case, how I made myself competitive. So when it came to medical school exams, I was first decile and I got a decision in every exam through medical school. US Emily's, I got a 262 in my step one and a 264 in my step two CK. And the step two CS is just pass fail. So I passed that first time because you don't want to have uh, any fails on your list. Then when it came to research, I had 12 publications, I had six posters. When it comes to electives, I, did, I got US clinical experience through Well Cornell and also at Cleveland Clinic. When it came to letters of recommendation, through my time at Cleveland Clinic, I had um, a letter of recommendation because the more prominent the person is and how well known in the field, the better. I got a letter from someone who was the president of the American Academy of Dermatology, which is like the biggest society uh, for dermatology in the US. So that was huge because it was a very prestigious letter. Um, my home institution from Imperial College, I got someone who was the head of the World Health Organization, uh, like public health research center there who I knew, who again, like that, that name, the World Health Organization has kind of international residence. So um, I talk about this in our list of recommendations section, et cetera, but the more prominent you can get to make it look like it has that wow factor, that helps. And then, yeah, I had other letters. So I had my four letters basically from my US clinical experience. And then in the cycle that I was applying, so when I left my F1 job in 2016, I actually came to New York and I did a postdoc research fellowship during the six months while I was applying for the match. So I was local. So that also enhanced my CV. So it kind of ties in all these different parts that I was trying to explain to you guys. Um, 
that's how it applied to my case. And that's why when people ask me like, oh my God, you're an IMG who got into dermatology. How did you do that? There's no shortcuts. Like these are the things that the things that I told you is how you make yourself competitive. That's how you do it. And that's the way I did it basically. So just to summarize briefly, what is Liberty Medic? So as I'm sure a lot of you guys are feeling now from what I saw in the comment section, there are like a thousand questions of how this process works that as UK students, we just don't know. And we're at a pretty strong disadvantage because when you look at other countries, whether they're from the UAE or whether it's India, Pakistan, etc., they have a well-trodden path. They have years and years of their colleagues who do this. They either go to America or they go to the UK. So they know what this process is. In the UK, I very much felt alone. When I was going through this, I, I was the only one that I knew of in my, my group of friends who was going through this. And that makes it a very lonely position and that ends up you messing things up, right? Because people say, oh, but you can Google this. But what if you don't know what to Google, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. So how can you type something into to look it up if you don't know you're supposed to be looking it up? So I personally made mistakes in this process. I ended up missing deadlines for things that ended up costing me like a lot of time and money and unnecessary effort and stress and all kind of things. Um, and I couldn't find like a resource that would just talk me through how this happened basically. All I could find was things like Kaplan courses, which were like $5,000 for like a step one course. And I was like, okay, that's fine. But like, what about everything? Like, how does this process work basically? I'm a medical student or doctor in the UK. I want to go to the US. How does this work? So that basically gave rise to us starting Liberty Medics after I went through it myself. And we started off doing live courses basically at Imperial because that's where I was from. And, um, we were blown away basically by like the level of interest that we had from different people, whether they were like core medical trainees or medical students. Um, that's actually a, a medical student called Lizzie who was from Cardiff. So that's why I put Lizzie in there as well. So, you know, shout out to Cardiff. So um, we had people from all different places and they were like flying in from other countries and, and traveling by train just to get this information. And we get like messages from people being really gutted. Like, Oh my God, I can't make it this Saturday because I'm on call. When's your next course? And I'd be like in one year when I'm back in the UK when I'm back in the UK because I was still doing residency at the time. Um, so that basically gave rise to us wanting to make it a digital version. But briefly speaking, what we go through is like from the beginning, if you're toying with this idea, you think you want to do it, but you're not sure. We talk, we spent ages talking to what are the pros and cons? Cause if you don't have the right motivation for why you want to do this, you're not going to be able to complete this process because it's tough. It really is tough. So we go through, you know, the pros and cons uh, is money a good reason is lifestyle is the quality of training better. What about things like the political situation in the US? Is that a big con? All those kind of things. We talk about those. We tell you how to do the admin stuff, the boring ECFMD registration stuff. Then we go through the step exams in a lot of detail. So we talk about what the best timeline to take them is. A lot of people are asking the question box, like when should I take the exam? Talk to the timeline, the best study resources, how to make the most of those resources. Because knowing what the study resources are is pretty easy. It's like, I'll tell you now, it's like first aid, U World, Pathoma. Like we know what those resources are. You can do a quick Google search, but how do you actually make the most out of each of those test day tips, et cetera, for all the exams. And then we talk about us clinical experience, you know, what are the different types? So I've listed the types here. What are the differences between those? How do you get those? And then if you do get us clinical experience or so how to make the most of them, letters of recommendation. Yeah. What is a good letter of recommendation? What should you try and like make sure they put in there? Then the match process itself, like how expensive is it all? How does it work? What should, how does the application look personal statements? And then finally, when we go through, like, hopefully when you've matched, what about the visas and immigration section? So as Dr. Ban mentioned, it can take several hours and we spend time talking through the different visas and immigration options through that. So we really want it to be like a front to end, like I'm a little bit interested to, I know everything and now I know how I'm going to get my green card. Like that's what we wanted to, to cover in that journey. And we thankfully earlier this year managed to make it into an online version, like a digital version. Our friend uh, Ali Abdal, I don't know if you guys know him. He's, he's like a famous YouTuber from Cambridge, a doctor as well. He helped us uh, turn it into an online version of course. So um, yeah, we, uh, we keep updating that. So it has all those videos I talked about and we're adding things like the program director interview series, uh, a day in the life series where we talk about different specialties in the U S and we keep adding to that basically. And, and my philosophy is we wanted to make it so it wasn't like a monthly fee that like I signed up now, but now it means I have to renew it next year because I started too early and I delayed myself. The timeline that we all have for this process is different. So we want it to be that once you get it, that's it. It's lifetime access and it's yours, whether you're in first year and you want it for the next six years or whether you're applying right now and you want it now. So um, if that's something which you guys are interested in, check out libertymedics.com. And this is briefly what the website looks like. Um, and it, uh, as, as uh, uh, Amanda mentioned, that our website has a bunch of these free articles as well. So you don't just have to uh, go there if you want to subscribe. If you want to go there and just answer some of these questions, like uh, some of the pop-ups we have on there right now, how does coronavirus impact IMG applications? Is the quality of training better for doctors in the US? How much money do doctors make in the US? What's the cost of residency applications? Why I personally left the NHS? All of these kind of things are available as completely free articles on there. So do check that out. 
And then this is what the course itself looks like. So all those things I spoke about on the side, uh, in terms of the different topics we go through, this is just showing you what the videos themselves look like, the interface. This is sped up, even though I do talk fast, I think that is sped up. Um, and then as, at the side, you can see here, probably in the recorded version better, all the different things that we go through. And you can see all the videos that are basically part of this course catalog. So that's what that looks like for a more deep dive, because I feel like I've been like on times five speed to try and fit in. I'm sure I've gone over my timeline, so I apologize, Amanda and Seth. Uh, I've been on bad behavior here, but I'm happy to take any questions with Dr. Ban. And otherwise, those are the details for how you can reach out to us or follow us on social media. And over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, Dr. Thelma. Well, no, brilliant presentation, honestly. And I was so like amazed by the speed and the, the amount of content that you were able to like manage, you know? So thank you very much for that. Um, guys, I just wanted to thank the speakers first for just answering so many questions on the chat box. Many of them have been answered. I think almost all of them. Uh, if the participants had, like had a question that didn't get answered, please put them down below here now because we're gonna have a quick Q&A. And of course we understand that this is a very uh, extensive uh, topics to cover in just an hour time. So um, you guys have Liberty Medics to access that you can have all of the answers there as, as Dr. Osama mentioned. Uh, you also have Dr. Ban's email and also a participant called Evelyn just posted um, this website called Young Academics, which matches uh, the, the, the medics to the researchers uh, for you to get research done. So that's also very helpful. Um, let's see if we have any last minute questions on the chat. Uh, they are, they're asking about how to prepare for step one. Um, I know a lot of people who use UFAP, but how do I utilize these resources? So again, it's, it's obviously a big question, Dr. Ban. I don't know if, if, if you prefer to step in. Uh, I don't mind answering first and then, and then uh, you can take it from there. But um, yeah, so the thing is, there are no shortcuts to the step one. What, what I always say about the step one exam, maybe other people disagree, but I think it's one of the fairest exams that you can take, meaning what you put in, you will get out. I felt like so many times in medical school, I would spend like, not that long, but weeks and weeks preparing for medical school exams. And then in the end, they would ask me the weirdest questions, like that would switch on a subtlety, like what is the next best? And they're like, wait, next or best next, next test? Like, I don't know. And then you'd mess up the answer and it would drive me crazy. Like all those weeks I studied and I didn't feel like they extracted the knowledge I gained from me. The step one exam is like a seven hour exam and they ask you tons of questions and it's on the actual content. So there is no shortcut for time. You have to put in the time and you have to put in the effort. The resources, yeah, so there are, there are textbooks, first aid, uh, there's video series called Pathoma, which is uh, wonderful, which you should work through. And then there are question banks. And what I always tell people is the question banks are the key. It's all about the question banks. No one has ever like, taking the step one exam and afterwards we're like, you know what, I really regret not reading that extra textbook. Everyone says, I wish I had done this question bank more always. And yet we know that, we know that to be true, but we kind of try to ignore that point. So it's really all about question banks. And as I mentioned, it's, it's a vast topic, but roughly speaking, that's, that's the thing. You have to put in the time, you have to put in the effort, uh, you have to have the discipline, and you need at least, if you can work very efficiently, like seven, eight hour days, and you're a good test taker, you need three and a half months to four months. If you're someone who needs more time and you want to have a life and you want to have a more relaxed timeline, you have to set aside more than six months if, you, if you're talking for a top score. Um, so that's the brief summary to that. And there's a lot more to it, but that's, I think, a good summary. And if Dr. Ban has anything else he wants to add. No, I think you pretty much covered the basis. I totally agree with everything you said. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ban and Dr. Osama. Uh, guys, the questions about the, some of the questions about the slides, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be posted since now is our last webinar. All of our webinars were recorded previously and they're going to be posted on our page, our social media pages. So keep an eye on that. Um, and then you can go over all of the webinar presentations, which is going to be very helpful for you guys to also in this process of applying abroad. Uh, no, but some people they, asked they about webinars. They only need the US one. No one needs to go. They, to oh, oh, only the US one. So <laughs> the US one is recorded and is going to be posted, so you guys can rewatch the presentations from these amazing speakers. Um, other people asked about how to get research experience in the US before the elective. Uh, do we just send out lots of cold emails? 
I think the short answer is yes. Um, and uh, most people here got, get a lot of cold emails anyway. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of that is down to luck and timing. Um, you know, I would definitely include your CV in an email and keep your email sharp. Uh, you know, you want to try and sell yourself, but you don't want to write a long essay because uh, most of the time it's just going to get ignored. And if you, if you don't succeed the first time, uh, try again. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ban. Uh, there's also a question about the key steps in the application process that will become more impor important than ever after the change of the scoring system in 2022. Yeah, so this is also something that I, I spoke to uh, the program directors about um, putting this to them basically. And, and the long and short of it is that the step one isn't going anywhere in a hurry. And the reason for that is um, even though they stopped giving the, the, the three digit score in, after January 2022, US students get their step one scores typically at the end of their second year of medical school and they apply then during their fourth year of medical school. So that means that even after 2022, you're talking like the class of who are applying in 2024 will still mainly have step one scores. So if you're applying in that kind of timeline, the step one score isn't going anywhere for a while. So just keep that in mind. It's still worth doing really well in it. But once that does go away, a lot of programs, even though they're not sure right now, they're all trying to figure it out. They're kind of freaking out right now because then they're not sure what they're going to use as their first tool. Naturally, the step two CK is still going to retain the three digit score. So all of the same stresses that used to exist on the step one will basically just be offloaded onto the step two CK in a lot of ways because programs need a fast and easy way to screen down a thousand applicants to like the 100 or 200 that they can manually re review. And that will always be the use of an easy number. So the step two CK will have increasing importance. Your research and publication numbers are gonna have increasing importance and more so than ever before US clinical experience and getting to know a department and them knowing you as a person is gonna be infinitely more important when you don't have that extra asset to use. Um, but any one of you who are on this talk right now, you have it in your power to take it before the score uh, system changes. You do, you have a long time now. Between now and the score change, there's like 16 months or something. No one needs 16 months to prepare for an exam. So if you're making excuses to yourself or thinking, oh, I'll just wait till it passes, don't, don't, don't. You're gonna regret it. Just do it. You're planning ahead, you register for the seminar, you're doing great right now. Uh, don't lose this momentum. Take it now, commit, just book a test period, put your money down and that way that's it. You've committed a thousand dollars, you're gonna do it now. So um, that's my advice. But yeah, the other things will become more important than I mentioned. I like that, just do it, just do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, also, there were some questions about if you don't match the first time round, can you reapply having tried to get more experience done, more research papers? Yeah, so uh, I, I think Dr. Ban already answered that. He, uh, he mentioned that in the section that he thought the first attempt is going to be your best attempt, but you know, you, there's nothing stopping you. And I would, I would echo that. Like, the, but I, I know tons of people who didn't match the first time around. It happens all the time. So of, the, of all of the IMGs that apply, almost half don't match the first time around. Um, but tons of people match the second and third time around. So strengthen your application, add to your uh, research profile, go out there and spend more time with the department on observerships, and you absolutely can apply again. There, there actually isn't a way when it comes to on the other side of this, because having uh, been involved in the selection process from Mount Sinai now, I know what it looks like on the program director side of this. And there isn't actually a way of really quickly seeing uh, if someone has applied before and not matched. So um, they can tell for US students, because US students, if, if the year of graduation and the year they're applying to is different, that means they didn't match typically. But IMGs, we don't always apply right after we graduate anyway. So that's good. You can live in that gray space. You can live in that ambiguity and they may not necessarily know you're not, you're not applying for the first time around. Um, but most programs prefer fresh graduates. So don't put it off too long. And some places do use filters where they filter from uh, years since graduation. So they can filter, but no one does that typically for less than like two years. So um, it's best to do it as early as possible. But if you don't get it the first time around, you absolutely can match again. Don't give up. These application cycles are like one, two, three, four years, even if it takes you, right? Who cares? Like our UK colleagues, it takes them 12 years to become a consultant in England. Even if you apply four or five times and then do residency in America, you'll be a consultant the same age as them. So don't worry about it. And the US doctors are older than you because they've done undergrad and postgrad. So you already have a couple of years on them. So stay relaxed about it. Ideally, you're going to match first time. You follow our advice, everything, you're going to be fine. But if it doesn't work out, not a big deal. So what? Locum for another year or, or reapply again, make yourself stronger. And uh, if you want it badly enough, you can absolutely get it. Perfect. I will add to that by uh, cautioning, especially for, uh, you know, small specialties like mine. 
that uh, you know the community is so small that if an applicant applies again, the program, uh, like Dr. Sai was saying, um, there's no way for them to know if you have applied before other than if they recognize your name or recognize your picture and your application. So for small specialties, uh, you know, that comes up quite a bit. And, you know, from a program's perspective, if you step into their shoes, you know, if they didn't offer you an interview the first time around, you would really have to have a drastically improved application for them to really even consider offering you an interview this time. So it's not impossible, but uh, something to be aware of. Yeah. yeah. And, and I agree. I mean, if you're applying for neurosurgery dermatology, you're already in a very uphill battle. So, uh, and, and, and like Dr. Wan mentioned, those are very small fields. You know people by name, like almost straight away. But um, if you're applying more globally, like I am programmed, there's like over 300 in the whole country. So like, they're not going to remember all the people that, ha that applied to them. One year, they may have decided to set the application filter at this level. The next year, someone else might be more involved or in the associate PDs and they can change their requirements. So again, don't be like, if, unless I've gone off and done three or four more publications, it's just not worth me trying. You can, you can absolutely try again. And there's inexplicable reasons why it does work. Sometimes people don't apply very broadly the first time around. They, they try to be more selective. Second time around, they decide, you know what? Like, Iowa is not too bad. I kind of like Iowa. Maybe I want to go to Iowa. Or they'll apply to another specialty, like they'll add on neurology as well as internal medicine or pediatrics, and then it broadens their, their options more. So, um, but yeah, I agree with Dr. Ben. If you're applying for some, some ultra competitive, it's going to be harder and harder each year. Great. Okay. Uh, and now a question about uh, your experience training slash living in the U.S., in New York, in Dallas. Like, how is it more to the aspect of just living and training there? Uh, Dr. Ban, do you want to go first or should I go first? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, just on the aspect of uh, living and training in Dallas and New York for you both. Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, in terms of Dallas, uh, it's a very big city. Uh, if you consider the Metroplex, uh, it's one of the largest met Metroplexes in the U.S. Uh, you can find pretty much uh, anything here that you can imagine as far as, you know, entertainment, restaurants, and, and all that stuff is concerned. Um, training is great from, from that perspective in that uh, we are the, um, you know, referral center. Uh, the outskirts send their, send their patients all to us, uh, particularly the really challenging ones. Um, the downside, and perhaps not so much for for my program specifically, but if, if one were to pursue, let's say, uh, neurosurgery in, in, in a more, um, uh, in, in a city with more programs like New York, for example, uh, my feeling is that they may see a little bit of competition between all the different institutions there. Uh, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, a situation where there are only bad things, but, you know, there could be, uh, uh, good things to sort of uh, take away from that and that you have more uh, support and, and sort of more, you have a larger network of people uh, that you can count on um, as opposed to just being the sole program in town. Um, and from my experience, I, for a bit of context, when I, when I left London to, to, to come to the US, in my head, it was the case that I'm never going to find a city I love as much as London. Like, I love London. I had an amazing time there. But you know what? The job of a doctor in England is terrible, in my opinion. Sorry. <laughs> it may, may be great. But for me, I was like, the job of a doctor is terrible in, in, in London, so I'll enjoy my job in America more. So that's what I came out thinking, is that, like, nothing's ever going to replace London for me. Um, I now have changed my mind about that. And for me, New York is the best place I've ever lived in my life. It's... Um, it gets under your skin. It's one of those things where obviously like a home for everyone. Like you'll get some people telling you from England that like, oh, Essex is the best place in England. And it's because it's their home, right? So like you, you get to know it. We all know objectively it's not true, but it's fine. That's, that's, that's their area, so they like it. And for me, it's probably the same thing, but like living in New York, the, the people surprisingly. So whenever I speak to Americans and I say, oh, I love the people in New York, they're so friendly. They all look at me like I'm crazy because New Yorkers aren't known to be friendly by American standards. What you realize is, is England is like less friendly than almost any part of America. Like the people in America are just generally more like talkative and more friendly, whereas we're very cynical and standoffish in England. And when I first came to America, I remember I was like on my elective, I was walking on the streets and people would be like, good morning. And I'd be like, good morning. Like, 
I don't know, they can ask me something, do they want money or something? And then they kept, it kept happening. And I was like, what is going on today? Like, do I look really good today? Do I smell good? And then I realized that like, this is just what life is like here. People, you'll be in an elevator carrying a bag and someone will be like, oh, what you got there? And in England, I'll be like, mind your business. But like in America, after a while, you're kind of like, oh, I have this thing. Like I, went, I got it from this place. Like, I don't know, people are just generally friendlier. And I found that like the energy of the people and like the general life here for me one of the biggest parts of even deciding to come to america was also like i want to try something new like you know england's great like i had a good time living there i've been there since i was a kid but my best case scenario looking forward is basically replaying my own life but from the perspective of like my dad like my dad was a doctor in england so i was like my best case scenario is i'll end up being a consultant in england and have my kids go to grammar schools and have them go to imperial and have them be doctors and like it just felt so like same same for me that I just wanted to try something new. So for me, being out here in a new country, like going to like baseball games and getting to know a different culture and like all this kind of stuff, it was just, it's been amazing for me. So I've loved that kind of the, um, the variety of that that it's brought into my life. The training itself, it's a heaven and earth difference in my opinion, especially in a specialty like mine where you're, uh, where I'm able to focus on my specialty so much earlier on in my life. After one year of general medicine, which is known as the prelim year, I went straight into dermatology. So I wasn't doing, you know, core medical training and going nephrology for four months and elderly care for four months and something else for four months. I just went straight into dermatology and the amount of structured didactics time, like teaching time we get, I get something like five hours of protected teaching time in my schedule each week. So compare that to England where like you get like one grand rounds per week or something. And then even during that, you're getting paged by like four different pages and you're running off. And like, I just didn't feel like uh, the atmosphere there in England was such that they were actually trying to train you. They wanted you to keep the system alive, which is completely fair. Like it's the NHS, right? They need um, cheap labor to help provide the public with free care. Fair, we know we know what we're getting into, and I appreciate and respect a lot of what they do. But in that system, the people who suffer are the doctors, right? Like you're not actually there as trainees. You're there to already do a service, and occasionally you'll learn by osmosis. Like your consultant will be particularly nice. He'll teach you fine, but if you happen to get unlucky and you're in a team that doesn't care, that's it. You're gone after four months. They don't. They're not really invested in you. Whereas I found that since I was in my program here, the program director and the chairman, they know me by name because they're part of selecting me. They specifically sit down with you and ask you what your long-term uh, like future prospects are, how they can help you network with people. They fly in speakers from like all around America from different parts of your specialty to like come and talk to you guys before COVID and like to tell you about their area of expertise within your specialty. And it just felt completely different as a training experience. So yeah, I can't speak highly enough of it, but obviously it's a biased sample because I'm someone who actually decided to move. Um, so that's my opinion. No, yeah, but that's great. Great to hear your experiences and thoughts on living um, in the US. Uh, our last question, just because if we keep answering the questions, we're gonna stay here the whole day. So just uh, quickly, how, what are the common mistakes IMGs make? So um, I think, hmm. There are many. Uh, let me just pick a few that are uh, easy to fix. I think uh, maybe not so much from, from the UK perspective, but there are a lot of uh, IMGs that come from uh, countries that do not speak English as their primary language. And that can be perceived as a, a barrier, you know, a communication barrier. Can I work with this person? Can this person take care of my patients? And those are the sort of, you know, questions that programs will have in their minds that will ultimately uh, lead to these applicants being, you know, lower down the list of priority. Um, I think that's probably the number one thing. And um, yeah, from my perspective, I would say a couple of things, like I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't say they get wrong. Like it, it's tough to do these things, right? It, 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 it's not an easy journey to make. And I think uh, one part of it is, I guess, not not having realistic enough expectations so i i see some imgs who will first time round uh, apply for a very selective uh, handful of programs and be like no i well, i want to go to this i want to be in mayo clinic i want to do this and that's really nice and like i really hope you do get into mayo clinic but just know uh, know what you would be willing to accept from the beginning and do that in your first application cycle because uh, you'll have a choice to make right when it comes to march of that year like or, or february of that year when you're submitting your rank list any program that's interviewed you, you will decide whether to put them on your rank list. And then ultimately the algorithm spits out what the highest match was between like what, who ranked you and who you ranked. So 
think carefully about where you would actually uh, uh, be willing to go and uh, apply broadly the first time around, I think, if you're willing to be flexible about it, because it'll cost you a year of your life if, if you delay it. The other thing I'll say is people, um, people are very scared of taking the step two clinical skills exam. Typically, they get very like put off by this idea of having to have a practical exam. And I've seen some people who could have taken it, for example, with like a one month uh, like study period, but they were so scared of it that they decided to delay it. And based on that, they wouldn't get their score back in time to apply for that cycle. So they've, they've delayed their entire life and application cycle by a year because they were scared to take the step two clinical skills exam. And I think, again, if English is a native language to you, one month is plenty of time to prepare for the step two CS exam. It's easier than your medical school exams in England. So don't let that be the reason that, that it delays you. More broadly speaking, um, not being aware of these kind of different deadlines and different timelines you have to work towards. So something we talk about in the course is try and figure out what cycle you want to apply for and then work back thinking about each exam and when the score reporting periods are for each exam such that you make sure your entire application is ready for September 15th of the year that you're applying. And so many people get confused in that timeline where they don't give themselves enough time and they panic at the end. Like time seems to like crush together at the end where they're like, oh my God, that means I actually have two weeks to set my CK and my CS. And then on this day, if I don't get my score back, I'm screwed. So just give yourself the cushion, plan ahead um, and make sure you get your application timeline right. The other thing is, um, two more points. Uh, one is visas. So there's, a, there's something called the J-1 visa. If you're not a green card holder, et cetera, or a US citizen, there's something called the J-1 visa, which the majority of international medical graduates come to the US on. And it's known as a foreign exchange visa, where the idea is that you come to the US for your training, and the idea is you take those skills back to your home country afterwards. Now, no one actually intends to do that. They, they come over on the J-1 very much planning to stay. And uh, the ways you can do that after J-1 is you have to either work in an underserved area in the US for three years, or go back to your home country for two years before you're allowed to come on a different visa category and stay permanently in the US. So a lot of people end up just def by default getting the J-1 visa and not being aware of these different clauses that are attached to the J-1 visa. Where the, whereas there's a different type of visa known as the H-1B visa, which is harder to get. It requires you to sit your step three exam beforehand and uh, fewer programs offer it. But if you get ahead of it and you know which programs offer the H-1B visa, it can have a huge impact on your life. So I made sure that I came over to the US on an H-1B visa from the beginning. I refused J-1 visas. I said I wouldn't entertain it. And I specifically applied to programs that sponsored H-1B visas and ranked programs that uh, sponsored H-1B visas. That means that right now I'm in my final year residency at Mount Sinai, um, but I actually have a green card now because I applied for like a national interest waiver based on like publications and things like that, which you, you can do on an H-1B, but you can't do on a J-1. So had I been on a J-1 right now and I'm looking for jobs, I would have had to restrict my search. I would have had to find a place that can sponsor a visa. I would have had to live in uh, an underserved area for three years. But because I planned ahead, I was able to come on an H1, apply for my green card a year ago, and now be a legal permanent resident, and I can take any job I want in the US afterwards. So a little bit of foresight basically can go a long way, is what I would say. And then the final bit of like mistakes that some people make, some people, the flip side to the first problem I said is some people interview at a bunch of places that they don't really want to go to. They put them on their rank list, but they don't really want to go to them. And then they'll match in one of the, like their 15 choices or something. And they'll say, you know what? I don't want to go. So they'll try and withdraw from it. If you do that, that's called a match violation. And what that means is you agreed to go into the match. You agreed to contract with this other place and then you reneged on it afterwards. And that is like the biggest death sentence for your future prospects of uh, matching into the US of anything, because it comes up as a red flag the next time you apply. I've seen it, it's like a red exclamation mark next to your name. And then you look at those and you say, no, like th those people aren't reliable because I could give them a spot in my residency program and reject other people and then they may back out on me. So it is like the number one death sentence. So just don't do that either. Like if you're putting someone on your rank list, understand that that is a contractual obligation and understand that means that if they match you and you match them, you are going there. So that is the end of my TED talk on that. Well, thank you, Dr. Ban and Dr. Zama for such amazing pieces of advice. Um, this webinar is coming to an end. And right now, I would just like to ask all of the participants to use your re reaction button on Zoom because now we're in the Zoom era, right? And if we can have a big applause for these amazing speakers, in the UK, in the U US webinar. Uh, and on behalf of CHIPS, I just wanted to thank you and uh, Dr. Zama and Dr. Ban so much, so much for a bri brilliant presentations, uh, sharing your experience. We're really, really grateful. 
And we're also grateful to all of the participants and their amazing questions that helped us expand all of the information that we're passing on to you. Again, this webinar is going to be recorded and posted on our social media, so keep an eye on our uh, social media platforms for that. And uh, I really hope that everyone has a lovely Sunday. It's just been extremely uh, rewarding to, to organize this webinar series with Seth and Eunice. And we're all extremely grateful for everyone that attended and participated. Thank you so much. Enjoy your Sunday. And if I can ask Dr. Ben and Dr. Salman just to stay for a little longer uh, after everyone leaves, that would be very good. Have a lovely Sunday, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. To, to you guys on the organizing committee, you did an amazing job. I, I haven't been keeping up with the other webinars because only the US matters, I'm joking. But, um, but your whole team has been incredibly professional and uh, <laughs> shout out to Seth, he reached out to me like a month and a half ago and was so courteous, so professional that uh, it is what convinced me to, to, that you guys were a great organization. So well done to you guys as well, virtual and real applause. Yes, I have Thank, uh, Thank you. Yeah, Seth does a, a great job with that. <laughs> He was the one that had all the ideas and uh, started this whole thing. So credits to him, honestly. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Ban and Dr. Shin. Yeah, of course. Thank you.